today, if, if you sense that or suspected that, what's your reaction? What do you do? And how would you coach these parents to deal with it? Uh, great question because it, it puts you in somewhat of an awkward situation, right? You, your kids out there on the field, um, you don't want to embarrass them. Um, you don't want to you know, make the coach mad. Um, so I can see how for years people did not much. right way to do it. Um, you know, I would start now before the season even starts and ask that question of the league administrator or coaches and say, you know, hey, I, I went to a seminar and I learned all this stuff. Just curious, what's our policy on um, reducing the risk of head injury? Um, so you can avoid having that potentially embarrassing situation, you know, by, by being proactive about it. Um, if you're witnessing your kid being put through a trial or they're being, you know, made it to a human pattern ramp, I would walk right out into the field and put a stop to it. Um, there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't feel empowered to, to do that. Um, and, you know, it's, no one is going to advocate for your child the way that you are. And you should feel empowered to do that by all the information that's out there. Nobody's going to laugh for you off. Um, nobody's going to be So, the uh, answer is, you've got sons well planned. Yeah, uh, you know, the first thing, that do, and Benny already brought it up, is to ask now, before the season starts. Okay, the first thing, you know, as far as what I'm concerned with, is that, and litigation, is something that everybody got hurt, is that who trained the coaches? How did they learn how to tap? Okay, I know a lot of times, a lot of leagues, what they'll do is say, hey, you gotta go to, uh, you have to go to a, uh, convention or a seminar for a day about coaching. And they'll go to that seminar or that convention and they'll get the X's and O's. They're learning how to scheme somebody up. Okay? But have they specifically gone to a clinic that's allowed them to learn how to reinforce one of the two fundamentals of the game? Okay? Secondly, uh, like Ben said also, if you go out there you see somebody, first thing is in what part of the TAC Academy is that we have a, a series of drills that we go through in the off season, but when we start the first day of the season, there is no distance between the ball carrier and the tackler. We don't need to see that distance as far as creating impact, because that creating impact is a teaching technique. Okay? So what are they what are their plans on how are they going to teach that young man to tackle. Okay? I know they have plans to install their offense and to install their defense. But what kind of curriculum or plan do they have to assist that young man in becoming a better tackler? And if you go out the field and you have to see two guys five yards apart and some guy yelling go and two young men running ramming to each other, okay? Stop the drill. I mean, I'm, I'm going to tell you this personally. I've had two or three friends who have passed away recently. They've been NFL players. The disease is called CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. I heard what it said. But they have taken their lives after their character structure has changed, lost money, uh, memory loss combined with the families, and they couldn't take it anymore. Okay, I, I, the biggest thing in my life is I do not want to see young men that 12 or 14 years after they stop playing, their personality completely changes because somebody didn't step forward and say, that isn't right. No doubt, Coach Jody uh, could tell it to these parents who face that to level of work. Yeah, without sounding repetitive, I do echo both of their, their comments. I mean, act now. You know, be proactive. Um, tell them, you know, if, if they don't have anything, resources are available. You know, say, hey, listen, I, I saw some great resources online, or, hey, you know, do, do we have any of this type of stuff implemented, you know, in our in our league? If not, that might be something worth looking to, um, both from a health and a legality standpoint. And again, you know, no one's going to be a bigger fan than your, than your child than you are. Go in there and stop the drill.
pull them out of the drill for a second, ask them for a little quick water break, come on over. And then, you know, I don't think it's wrong with questioning uh, that coach at off, you know, off the field type of thing or, or you know, using the right chain of command with people to lead to make sure. I mean, you would do the same thing if someone was doing something inappropriate in the academic setting uh, that would be your son. Uh, uh, educational aspect, same thing, same thing. So the bottom line is know your coach as well. Um, try to know your coaches before the first day of practice. Hopefully a lot of coaches have that parent orientation that will get to you and you get to them. Um, I'm going to open up for other questions. I'm sorry. Can I just, yeah. just uh, want to make a comment before we miss the opportunity on the technique side of it. Um, obviously we're talking a lot about tackling. Um, there's, a, there's two other elements to football I think that are incredibly important. A lot of people here are probably the parents of linemen who are never really involved in a tackle. Um, the same technique and, and physics apply of eliminating the head butting that's going on at the line um, and teaching your linemen essentially to block from the hips and the shoulders with their arms. Um, so if you can eliminate that head butting that's going on all the time that the kids never tell you, hey, you know, if you really ask them, you'll hear kids open up that you know, I have headaches all the time. Um, that can be eliminated through technique. And the last thing, I'm, what I'm a huge proponent of, I think kids absolutely know air time, and probably do the single biggest, most important thing that could change football, is actually eliminating ball carriers and lowering their heads before they go into a collision. Um, all of the concussive episodes that I ever got were actually with a ball carrier lowering my head when I went into a collision. If you watch the game of football, you watch your own children play, it is the easiest thing to spot a kid do this. And when a kid does this, Tackler does the same thing, and now you have two battery rams going at each other. If you enforce the kids, vehemently enforce the ball carriers to keep their heads up, now you actually allow the tackler to come in and make that proper kind of a tackle, and you'll have a good football play um, instead of a, a collision. So I'm a huge proponent of that. I actually put a picture of myself in Dina's catalog in the back from high school. It's a picture of me with my head so low that you can read my name on the back of the jersey. The big circle, do not do this. Um, so I just, while we're talking about, while we're talking about tackling, I just kind of wanted to add in those other, other two techniques. Well, I've got one more for anybody. So when you think about the positions most prone for concussion, is there a positional breakdown that these parents can say to this quarterback, running backs, linemen, unit? Was there, there's a concern for everybody, no doubt, but is there a few positions, hot, hot positions that these parents should be aware about? Uh, the, they're all, there are certain statistics that may point one way or the other. I don't believe any of them. I think everybody's, you know, generally potentially at risk. Obviously, a quarterback or a wide receiver might be more at risk for that more rare, real high-energy blow. The lineman is probably more at risk for the repeated low-energy impact. Nobody knows which is more dangerous, one big hit versus 100 small hits. Assume they're all problematic. Really bad with the linemen, you know, of course, I, you know, that's my special view as a lineman. I, I hope you guys, I know your child's in one position, but if you come out there and watch us, uh, we wear the helmets for protective purposes only. But the game, that, the game, and the way it's changed the most in the last 10 or 12 years is that it's become a hand combative sport. In the bushes are running, you're separating, you're using your arm length to separate from the blocker. Uh, I would say, if, you know, your son's a lineman. Make sure that coach is talk about cage, hands, and hips. It's not that way. It's hands. You create separation. And then on pass rush, you're using your hands to deflect the offensive lineman's hand. So never in there do you ever hear me here talk about the helmet. It's worn for protection. And, and I think the bottom line is, and I know the whiplash hits for the quarterback. For some of the backs and receivers. But if you consistently, as a man or a young man, are told to put your head or your face in there, okay, it's oh, it's a time told story that you know you're just gonna have a lot more opportunities to get a concussion. Uh, one thing that uh, I've really said about when we talk about the tackle and have that ball carries or lower their head, we talk about hitting your eyes at ball level. So it usually happens when you lower the hand, you usually drop and bend more on your hips and your ankles and flexion. And we're always keeping our eyes at ball level, which keep our 
eyes up instead of having them stop their head. So we try to combat the leverage part of it by always getting our eyes at all levels. So more than all we lose is its height, we reduce our eye, our, the eye level height, but that still keeps our second, first and second vertebrae in a strong position so when we attack the ball carrier, you know, we're, we're as safe as we can possibly be. It's also just very important to point out what are you trying to achieve by making a tackle? Um, most people associate tackling with hitting. We cheer for hitting, we call kids, these are my hitters, he's my big hitter. Um, if you read the rule book, football, the National Federation of High School rule book, which I have read, uh, there is nothing in the rule book of football that rewards hitting. This is a, hitting has become a cultural phenomenon, a highlight film phenomenon. All you're trying to do stop the forward progress of the ball. When you really boil it down to what you're attempting to do, stopping the forward progress of the ball is the effective football play. Um, so if you take coach's technique, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, you can make a fantastic tackle without ever even bringing the guy to the ground. If you stand him up and drive him backwards and a couple other teammates form in, the referee blows the whistle and the play is over, and you've done your job. Absolutely. In fact, one of the things I start off my lectures when it says in your book, right, in the rule stats, it'll say T, A, T, or N, T. You don't go B, hit, tackle. So it's either tackle, assistant tackle, or miss tackle. That's it. Now, I know part of the culture is that we will go out there and, and people get energized because of big hits. But the bottom line, if you don't let them cross the goal line, okay, or make that first down because your tackle is effective, you've done your job on Okay, I'm going to turn to the parents and um, ask anyone to raise their hand if you've got a question. I'm going to go far left, show them what happened. Yes, I'm sorry, sir. What does this mean by that? PAR, it's Concussion Recognition Act. PAR, Concussion Recognition Act. I'm sorry, I can't even see it. I just saw that. Next question. Is there one recognized standard for return to court?